Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so excited. I was like, hey, you guys better come. If you RSVP, man, you better be here. And sure enough, you did. <laughs> wow, this is just so awesome. I'm, I'm so excited. You know, I just, I started this meetup because I, I really thought we had a lot here in Boston and Cambridge, you know. I mean, uh, New York, San Francisco, no, it's happening here in Boston. So I wanted to bring together some of these researchers and, and today, you know, Wow, I'm just, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, G20 Ventures. I'm not even going to talk too long because I want to let our main speaker get up here. But thank you, all of you, for coming. Thank you, MIT Bitcoin Club, for the, the help that you've given us. And just thank you, all of you who have stepped in and helped with the meetup and everything. So tonight we have a really special uh, presenter, and you all know who he is. Um, he uh, has a long history in this space, and I've heard some people call him the grandfather of blockchain. Well, that's something when you're only, well, 31 years old. <laughs> but that tells you how young this, this space is. Anyhow, um, Charles Hoskinson has gone on to do some really cool things, and he started Input Output Hong Kong, and uh, they are the firm behind uh, the Cardano blockchain. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Hoskinson. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I shaved. You know, you know, everybody noticed that. Y'all you know, mind if I take a selfie? Okay. This is going on Twitter. All right, thank you so much. Appeal to vanity. Uh, so first, thank you so much, Amy, for putting this on, and thank you, Mike and G20 Ventures, for your hospitality. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Amy asked me to do this event for a while, and I said, okay, you know, we'll have five, ten people. And she said, oh, no, it'll be like 40. And she's like, okay, that's a big group. And now, what are we, like 200, 300? 400. 400, wow. Okay, so uh, let's play the, the distance game. How far did everybody travel? Anybody here from outside of Massachusetts? Wow. All right. So what about you? Four hours from Burlington, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont. Wow. Can anybody beat that? That's Florida, yeah. Singapore. Wow, they win. I don't know what the prize is, but give them something. Okay, so the topic of tonight is third generation blockchain technology. And that's kind of funny because many people have just recently or have only been in the space for a little while. We're already in the third generation, apparently. So that's going to be fun. So I've been in the space for a long time. I've been in the space uh, first as kind of a lurker and a watcher since Bitcoin was a dollar. And back then, it was a very different environment. We would never fill a room like this. Uh, I mean, you could be like, come free money, pizza, everything you want, and we'd get like six people. Okay. Uh, now, this has been pretty common, and it's amazing to see the growth of passion and excitement. But back in the first generation, back in the day, and this was like 2009 to 2012, 2013, uh, basically, we were just trying to solve a very simple problem, which was, could you create a form of decentralized money that actually has value and nobody controls it, doesn't have a central party behind it? As it's to net, today, it seems like obvious, right? Yeah, we have that. We have Bitcoin. But back then, it was actually a very controversial and interesting question. You'd mine something, but who would buy it? Where would you trade it? Where would you sell it? I remember back when Bitcoin was a dollar, I'd be like, I have all this Bitcoin. And my friends would be like, yeah, but what can you do with it? I said, but you don't understand. One day, I can do a lot with it. And they were like, ah, oh, you're crazy. OK, go away. So it was, it was a heck of a lot of fun. But here's what happened. It got valuable. So it went from a dollar in a very short period of time up to about $250 during the Cyprus crisis. And what that meant was that people started taking it seriously. And when they started taking it seriously, what's the first thing that happens? People start commenting, yes, but. They want to do something to it. They want to build a business on it. And they start discovering that Bitcoin wasn't good enough. So there was an invitation for augmentation. So we started seeing lots of things like altcoins. We started seeing overlay protocols like color coins and master coin materialize. 
So right around that time period, I said, you know, uh, what the heck do I have to lose? I'll just go into the Bitcoin space and do something professionally, have some fun. The problem was I didn't know anybody. I, you know, I, I knew of Bitcoin. I had a forum handle of Bitcoin Talk and Bitcoin Reddit. I mean, that's basically the extent of my exposure. So I said, here's what I'll do. I'll, I, I'm an academic. I'll teach a class. So I'll create a free online course and release it for Bitcoin. Yay. And I'm a Peter Sellers fan, so I named it Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto after Dr. Strangelove, right? And so I put on a Udemy, put on under a Creative Commons license, I released it, and I got, today I think I like 70,000 students or something like that. And I got 5,000 emails, and I replied to every single one of them. And what I gained from that is I got to meet everybody. I met Adam Levine, I met Andreas Antonopoulos, I met a lot of venture capitalists, and I, it was just an amazing experience. And from that, I was able to leverage a career and build some companies. But the thing I'm known for is the project of frustration. That's Ethereum. And that came a little bit later. So what happened was that there was a convergence of forces. So I had worked on a project called BitShares, and I'd worked with many other people in the space, and we were all kind of in a, in a rock and a hard place, where every time we build a protocol, we'd want to add something to it. But after you deploy a cryptocurrency, it's really hard to change it. That's kind of the point. So how do you upgrade after you've deployed? What, you know, it would be so nice if you had a programming language or a scripting language that let you do that. And right around the same time, Vitalik Buterin was working on Color Coins, Master Coin, and he was just in development hell. He was having all of this trouble trying to upgrade Color Coins and Master Coin to do reasonable things. Okay, so he said, "Wouldn't it be nice if it was like the web when JavaScript came to the web browser, and we just got a programming language, and now we have Gmail and Facebook and all these other SaaS products, right? So wouldn't it be so cool if we had a programming language for a blockchain?" Now, this wasn't a completely new idea. It has its roots back in the 1990s from Nick Szabo. It's called the Smart Contract. And actually, Sergio Lerner, who's another pioneer in the Bitcoin space, who's underappreciated, uh, was one of the first people to talk about Turing complete scripting contracts. And now he's one of the co-founders of the Rootstock Project down in uh, Buenos Aires. So Vitalik wrote a white paper, and I got dragged into it. And boy, we had a lot of fun, along with a lot of other people, and we built Ethereum. And that's the second generation. It's, I want my transactions to be smart, and I want my transactions to do meaningful things. Okay, so it's not good enough to have money. It's not good enough to have a decentralized database, a blockchain, whatever the heck that means. But you also want the things that are happening to be eventful, stateful, rich, and programmable. So for example, imagine if you have a business logic where you have a board of directors, and you have normally three of five people are required to sign for a transaction. But on December, uh, it goes down to two of three because two of those directors go on vacation. That's your business's custom logic. I can't predict that. But with a smart contract, you can write that kind of a relationship, financially speaking. And it can be as arbitrarily complex or arbitrarily simple as you want. The point was that you're in charge of that transaction. So this was a crazy idea. We took enormous criticism for it. We had no thought that it was ever going to succeed. We released it, now it's worth $100 billion, and everything's gone mad, right? Yeah, it's paper. <laughs> so here's what's happened, is that the world has kind of caught up, and they said, decentralized money, that's a really good idea. Okay, check the box. Smart contracts, we like them. There's a lot of cool things you can do, and now we're having questions of how do we want to do them. You know, they want to be turn complete, turning incomplete. Do we want to write special languages for them? Do we want to write them in normal programming languages? Are we going to run them on blockchain, off blockchain? But the concept is OK. Check. Do they work for billions of people? No. Crypto kitties killed us. <laughs> Be killed by a cat. Oh, well, at least we have a few more lives. So anyway, they don't work at scale. The other problem is we have Thousands of them, right? If you go to coin market cap, you'll see all these cryptos all the way down. A few I built. And guess what? They don't talk to each other. A lot of them are blind, deaf, and dumb. So that's not a good thing. Finally, how do you decide how to pay for things and to govern things with cryptocurrencies? So let's say that you are a genius cryptographer, and you're like, yeah, man, I'm going to solve this quantum computer crisis. I have XMSS. It's the best signature scheme ever. And he's also a genius cryptographer. And he's like, nah, man, lattices are like so much better. We're going to go with Bliss or Dilithium or something like that. 
okay, these are two proposals, and let's say they're both great guys. How do we decide which one to go with? Who gets to decide that? Do we just go to Bitcoin Talk? We go to Reddit? Whoever has more Twitter followers? I mean, like, what is the empirical, meaningful, systematic way upon which we are going to govern these open source, not centralized, not curated protocols without an appeal to a cult of personality or something along those lines? And that's a challenging question. And we've already seen the fractures of governance. Anybody here hear the block size debate? Yeah? Anybody here have any Bitcoin cash? Anybody have any Ethereum Classic? Uh, there we go. I'm just going home now. Um, okay, so anyway. So anyway, uh, basically we have governance crisis. And it's a very challenging one, and it's one that it creates a barrier to consumer and enterprise adoption. Because you as an executive can't go to your boss and say, hey, CEO, I think we should use this blockchain for this thing. It's like, yeah, but we have no idea how it's going to change, who's going to change it, when it's going to change, and what it's going to do. And we have no say in the matter. It's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I should build a billion dollar product on that. <laughs> I mean, think about that. It's not a really good, meaningful conversation. You know, the other thing is, how do you pay for stuff? So we have the ICO. Anybody here have an ICO? <laughs> yeah, right. SEC's not in here, I think. <laughs> right, okay, good. So what is the ICO? Well, you know, we inadvertently created a Rube Goldberg machine with Ethereum for venture capital, which really makes Mike's life difficult, right? People are like, wait, wait, why do I have to give you equity? I can just issue a token and raise 10 million or something like that. But that's, that's temporary. Don't worry, we'll, you guys will be okay. But uh, basically, you just issue a token, like an ERC-20 token, you go do a crowd sale, whatever that means, and you raise a bunch of money, and now you have a bunch of money. And you can go spend it, and it's a donation, so no strings attached. But no, levity aside, the ICOs are great, and they're becoming regulated. There's lots of ideas, from Smart Valor to Block House and others, Project Brooklyn from Consensus, about how to do these things, how to govern the funds that are collected, the checks and balances and controls that ought to be put together. So. That's wonderful, but it's an injection of capital. And like an IPO, these are injections of capital that you can't do consistently and repeatedly, right? So what, how do you pay for things long-term? And how do you pay for things without having a big pool of money laying around that somebody's going to control? Okay, so we have that problem again. So we have a sustainability problem as well. So we have a scalability problem. We have billions of users that are coming in and we don't know how to handle them and CryptoKitties is killing us. We have an interoperability problem in the ecosystem where we have thousands of cryptocurrencies and they're all just not talking to each other well. And we have a, sust a sustainability problem where basically you can't figure out how to pay for things without these damn ICOs and also it's hard to figure out where to go. So whenever you have problems that are indicative of your size, scope, and scale, whenever you have problems that occur as a consequence of success, that's a good symptom that you have a new generation coming. Just like in the old days, where when we went from first generation to second generation, we were saying, gosh, everybody's trying to get smarter transactions, everybody's trying to do more, but every time we try to do it, it's painful. Now we're in the same situation where I want to do all this cool stuff, but I want to do it on a global scale, I want to do it with traditional systems and other people's systems, and I also want to build a community with ha having to hold a billion dollars of their money and trying to play venture capitalists. That's a big challenge. And that is basically an invitation for the third generation of cryptocurrencies. It's an invitation for new classes of technologies. So congratulations, you've lived through two generations already. Isn't that cool? You all have, should have like white beards and be like Vince Cerf and be like, ah, oh, back in my day, we screwed up so bad. <laughs> right? Okay, so what is IOHK, what is Cardano, and what are the other third generations? So after Ethereum, I kind of had the luxury of being able to start a kind of company that I wanted to start. So I'm kind of an academic. I, I studied mathematics. I like analytic number theory. And so I said, you know, there's a deficit in our space with respect to rigor. There's both a peer review and academic deficit, and there is an engineering deficit. So on the peer review side, we have a lot of people writing papers. And those papers are not really rigorously checked by people who should be reading them. And these papers are playing with not simple things. They're playing with cryptography, with programming language theory, they're playing with game theory, they're playing with all kinds of things that people spend a lifetime studying. 
and rigorously reviewing and having to go to great schools like Harvard and MIT and Boston University and CU Boulder <laughs> to, <laughs> all right, best for last, go Ralphie. But anyway, they have to go to these great schools to learn how to do these things, and then they have to go submit their papers to a conference for the computer science side or a journal for other sciences, and guess what happens? You get your paper rejected. Or if it gets accepted, it's like conditionally accepted, and they yell at you, and then you have to go and show the paper off, and then they yell at you. And it's like a very masochistic process. Uh, there must be a special kind of crazy that goes into these fields. But the end result is that you actually have some degree of assurance that the paper may be right, that the claims may be reasonable, that the things we're trying to do may be accomplishable, and that they've been checked by people who've spent their lives thinking about this stuff. So I said to myself, it'd be so cool if I started a company that did that. But that alone is kind of not a business model. It's kind of a loss leader. You spend money, but there's like not money coming from the other side. So I said, you know, I need, do need to do something. So why don't we build cryptocurrencies for a living? That would be a heck of a lot of fun. So I said, OK, but if we're going to build them, we're going to build them like a mathematician would build them. So we're going to build them in Haskell, and we're going to build them with formal methods. So what the bloody hell is Haskell? <laughs> Or what is functional programming? Well, basically, it's just a different way of writing code that brings it closer to math. And it's a different way of writing code that allows you to use all kinds of new tools to test and check what you're doing to make sure it corresponds with reality. It's not new. It's been around for a long time. The problem is it's a little harder to write Haskell code. It's probably a little harder to test it, a little harder to find developers. So it's not quite as popular as Java and JavaScript. But the other thing that Haskell can do that's really magical is Haskell also is really easy to work with formal verification tools. So what the heck is formal verification? Why should we care? OK, so you have a paper. OK, and I don't have another prop. Actually, I do have the stand. OK, and so you have your code. The code lives here. So your paper lives in like the Billiken land. Billiken is like a Japanese spirit of the god of the way things ought to be, not the way that things are. OK, so this is an ideal. It has ideal functionality, all these cool properties and features, and this lives in the academic's mind. Now let's assume the paper is right. Then at some point, an engineer comes along and says, I'm going to implement that paper. Cool, it goes over here and writes a bunch of code. And there's this gap. It's called the semantic gap. And basically, there's going to be a difference between what the academic did and what the engineer did. There's a thousand assumptions. There's a thousand ideal functionalities that had to be turned into real functionalities for the sake of practicality. For example, you can't instantaneously transport a blockchain to everybody right, right at the beginning of the launch of the network. It doesn't happen. But you can assume that to make a proof work. So there's this gap right here. And if you're not careful, the thing you end up building here isn't the thing that you wrote here. So all the promises, security guarantees, and things that you'd care about are actually not ported over here. So what formal methods do is they say, we're going to do something about this gap. We're going to write a specification that allows us to close it up a little bit. And it's going to extract all the ambiguity and be machine understandable. But it's not a full implementation. Then what you can do is use what's called a proof of by simulation here to here and actually show that every output here is the same as that specification. So in other words, it has no bugs. And as long as the paper is OK, the implementation is OK. And you're like, well, but Charles, that sounds great. Why doesn't all software do that? It is horrendously time consuming and expensive. And the French are involved with it. Who would want to be with these guys? <laughs> I'm serious. They screwed us, man. They're, the most popular formal programming methods language is called COQ, C-O-Q. I kid you not. So, so this is what we deal with. So out of principle, we use Isabel, which is slightly less popular, but we didn't want to say cock every day. Um, <laughs> and uh, levity aside, it takes a lot of time. For example, let's think of things you'd like to be verified. How many people here have operating systems? Well, you do. You have phones and computers, right? So the kernel of an operating system would be really nice to know that that's properly built. Because you know you kind of rely on that every single day for every single thing you do on the digital world. So somebody did that. It's called the SEL4 microkernel project. And it took over five years, millions of dollars, 180,000 lines of Isabel code to produce 7,000 lines of generated C that had some nice properties. That is not easy. 
So I said, you know, I want to build an engineering company because I'm kind of a crazy entrepreneur. Not only do I want to do the paper stuff right and go through peer review, but I also want to do this, but I want to do it quickly. Kind of a crazy idea. So that was the dream of IOHK, get the engineering right, do functional first and formal methods, and get the academia right. Started in 2015, there was just two people, my co-founder and I, and now we're 100, we operate in 10 countries, we've got nine figures of revenue. We have uh, a lot of projects we work on, the largest of which is Cardano. And uh, we're building Cardano with this type of approach. So what is Cardano and why is it a third generation cryptocurrency? And why do we think it's fun and interesting? Okay, so as I mentioned before, there are three characteristics, scalability, interoperability, and sustainability, that justify the third generation. Okay, so in terms of scalability, our belief is the best way to achieve that is as you gain users, you gain resources. Pretty simple. Good ideas should be simple. So do we can think of any other protocol that has this property. Anybody have any ideas? Yes, sir. IOTA. Maybe. <laughs> BitTorrent. Well, that's the one I was going for. It's more classical, less controversial. Okay. So BitTorrent, what is BitTorrent about? So first off, it has over 250 million concurrent active users. That's a lot. And it carries about a third of the internet's traffic. The only way you could have a protocol like that run consistently for more than 15 years is if you have a property that when someone enters the protocol, the protocol gains resources, it gains capabilities, so that you actually get faster or stay at the same performance despite the fact that you're gaining hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of users. That's a basic characteristic of scalability. Now, BitTorrent's quite simplistic. It's just moving data around. So cryptocurrencies are a bit more complicated, nuanced, because you have more than just moving raw data around. You have transaction processing capability, and this is where things like Hashgraph and IOTA are, are trying to make innovations. You have things like data storage, okay? So where do you put all the information? Who stores the blockchain? Is it sharded or not? Are you trusting somebody to hold it? And there's the actual data itself that you have to port and move around. Think about the consequences of having a system that runs at a million transactions per second. How much bandwidth would be required for a node to process that? It's not cheap, it's not small, and it's not coming from grandma's Wi-Fi. So our current models that we have for replicated networks for generation two, generation one cryptocurrencies exist in a world that everybody has a full copy of the blockchain, that everybody uh, has a reliable, stable internet connection and can keep up with the network. These are assumptions that will become untrue because we become victims of our own success. So to achieve real scalability, you need a protocol that gains transaction processing power, you need a protocol that gains network resources, you need a protocol that gives you more data storage as you gain more users. So that's the first property that we try to resolve with Cardano. Now the problem is that this is a horrendously complex task. A lot of people can claim that they've solved it or they know exactly how to do it or what it is, but it requires lots of protocols. It requires you to design network protocols. It requires you to shard large data sets. It requires you to implement new authenticated data structures. It requires you to put in new cryptography. This is a challenge. And no one solution can actually do all these things together. And also, let's say you think you have it. How do you know you have it? You need peer review. You need some bedrock to sit on. So in 2015, when we first started working on this project, the very first question we asked is, what is bedrock for a cryptocurrency? It turns out not until 2015 was there even an answer for what is bedrock. We didn't know what a ledger is. We had an idea of a blockchain, like an append-only linked list. There's been some ideas of directed cyclic graphs, these types of things, like Spectre, for example. Okay. And yet, we didn't actually know what properties they should have or how to write a security proof. So guess what we had to do? Our chief scientist had to write a paper on it. It's called GKL15, where we define, this is a secure ledger. This is the standard upon which we ought to be judged. Great. So the first question you ask is, Bitcoin a secure ledger? And actually, in the paper, they proved that Nakamoto consensus forms a secure ledger. So congratulations, Satoshi did something really magical. If it's Craig, kudos, because guess what? He heuristically designed a protocol that actually turned out to have all the security properties you'd want to have without providing any security proofs that did it years before anybody bothered to clean it up. 
that almost never happens. So Bitcoin's pretty magical, and uh, there's a reason why it's so loved. So proof of work solved that problem. Great. The next question is, what other pr types of protocols that are much more scalable have these properties? So we'd like to use proof of stake. There's a lot of good conversation around it. There's a lot of good science around it that's floating about. But does it have an equivalent level of security as proof of work? This is a horrendously controversial statement amongst the Bitcoin people. They say, of course not. But we're academics. So we said, let's use this foundation we've generated that we've proven that proof of work is secure with. And then let's go ahead and see if proof of stake has the same properties. And surprisingly, the answer is yes. Turns out that given certain assumptions, proof of stake can have an equivalent level of security as proof of work. That, to me, said we're in business. Now the question is, how do we make it practical? So what protocols do we have to marry it with so that we gain that scalability property? And what protocols do we have to marry it with so that it becomes a sustainable system? And so in 2016, we wrote up our proof of stake protocol called Ouroboros. We had to go through six revisions. We first submitted it to Oakland, got rejected. That's a tough conference to get into. So we went to one better called Crypto. We dusted ourselves off. We got into that conference in Santa Barbara. We had to go hang out with Addy Shamir and Whitlock Diffie and the rest of the old guys and some of the new guys and get yelled at, which is our favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. And then after that, we said, you know, we're not done. We have like six more papers to publish because this is hard stuff, one of which we presented this morning. And we wrote another paper called Ouroboros Prowse that's making our protocol more practical. And we have more papers on the way. But every single one of them is making that heartbeat, that consensus algorithm of our system, a bit more resilient, a bit more robust, a bit faster, and eventually it will gain resources as people join the network. Now that alone is not enough. We need a network protocol. We've chosen RENA. By the way, kudos to Boston. Part of RENA was developed here at Boston University. So, woo! Any BU grads? Okay. So, there's a guy named John Day, he helped create the internet, along with a lot of other people. And John is the guy who created recursive internet work architecture, wrote a lovely book about it, and he was one of many who looked at it, but looked at networking as a distributed computing problem. It's complicated and involved, so I won't go into it tonight, but it's a new type of protocol, it's a little different from normal network protocols, and the power and advantage of it is, you gain much more granular control over how you build these large-scale distributed networks. So you can model them so that you don't have to download everything and you still use them safely. Now, if we just did those two things alone, we'd have built a pretty good cryptocurrency. And it, you know, it'll be worth some money in trading. But remember what I was saying is that you have to be interoperable and also sustainable. Plus, it would be nice if we had good smart contracts and stuff like that, right? This is just generation one stuff. We're just trying to make generation one faster. Okay. So how are we doing smart contracts? Now, here's the problem. We screwed up with Ethereum. Sorry. First off, the virtual machine wasn't really well designed. And it was not well designed because we didn't put enough time into it, enough people into it, and we didn't have enough resources to really carefully think about what are we doing. The languages that we wrote, like Solidity. Anybody here a Solidity developer? Okay. Is that your favorite thing in the whole world? You just like wake up every day and be like, man, that Solidity is like Zen. Right, no. No one has ever said that about Solidity. I meet these closure developers, and they're like hanging out, painting to Bob Ross, like loving life, everything's great. And you meet a Solidity developer, you're like in a basement with whiskey, doing cold shots, saying, why won't this work? Okay, so that's an indication we kind of screwed up on language design. So Ethereum has a bit of problems. Ethereum itself acknowledges it, and they're fixing them. They're creating new languages like Viper and Bamboo. They're cleaning up the virtual machine and these types of things. They're even thinking about pivoting to WebAssembly. So evolution is on the way and things will get better in that ecosystem. But the first thing we do, because we're academics, is we say, well, what should the machine look like? So let's study what we did. So we worked with a team for, called Runtime Verification. They're based at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Huge campus, little city, wonderful place. Gregory Rochu and his team wrote the first set of formal semantics using something called the K framework, where they actually modeled the operational semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine. Huzzah! The hell does that mean? It means that we very carefully read the documentation and the papers and translated it into a formal language that's machine executable. In other words, we actually made the computer understand what we wanted to do, as opposed to what we actually did in code. Okay, what does that mean? It means that now you can actually rigorously look at the system and say, what did we do well? 
what didn't we do well, and what needs to be completely thrown away. Oh, God, what were we thinking? That kind of a thing. The good, the bad, and the ugly of systems design. So Grigori's team took the KEVM, which they published last year. They updated it, upgraded, and created a new register-based assembly virtual machine called Yella, named after a Romanian ferry. Uh, you, can, uh, you can guess where Grigori is from. <laughs> so anyway, great machine. We have the semantics for that. And we think that this is a much better foundation because it looks a lot like LLVM. Developers are a bit more familiar with that. It's easier to build compilers for that. It's much better studied than the current foundations that we have. But the problem is we also need to be able to write smart contracts in the languages that you want to write them in, not the language that Charles Hoskinson wants to write them in. right? So we said, wouldn't it be so cool if we had some sort of framework where all we have to do is just define a language, and then suddenly the framework itself would like build a compiler for you, and then you could just write your smart contracts in it, and you don't have to do anything. If I ever update the virtual machine, I just do it once, all the compilers auto build. And you say, oh, but Charles, if only. Well, it turns out that we may be able to do this, and we think we can. There's this thing called semantics-based compilation, and there's a thing called the K framework, and what you do is you write the semantics of a language, and K takes care of all of that translate your language into another language. So we have K semantics for Java, for C, for JavaScript, for Solidity, for Plutus, which is our own in-house language, and Viper. And we'll just keep writing them. We'll just keep making the framework better. The long and the short is that if we pull this off, you'll just write your code in the language you want, click a button, compiles, runs on our framework. And you don't have to worry about it or build your own compiler or these types of things. That's pretty cool. And it's actually a big innovation in computer science. And we're pretty excited about where we can take it. We have a very large team led by runtime verification that's working on that. And we think that's fun. OK, so we're pretty comfortable with the smart contract side of things. We're pretty comfortable with how this stuff is evolving. We love the fact that we're introducing lots of great formal methods. We even have conversations about like proof carrying code. And actually, we've even specified the first formalized ERC20 token spec, this type of stuff. That would be a cool product, but what we've just done is built a better Ethereum. And I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for to build a third generation cryptocurrency. So briefly, there's two last things I'll mention about Cardano, and then we'll take some questions because I know you guys are probably dying for them. First is interoperability. So what is interoperability really all about? What are we really trying to solve there? There are actually, it's amazing how there's two things, right? There's actually two things to worry about with interoperability. One is the legacy guys, the chases of the world, and the Wells Fargo's of the world, and the banks, exchanges, traditional regulated financial actors. Two are the cryptocurrencies of the world, okay? So the problem here is a problem of attribution and metadata and standards, and it's a problem of consensus within a community. And we just have to accept what they want to talk to them, because they kind of own their side of the system. It's a negotiation. But this is a problem resolved by committee, and it's a problem resolved through things like Interledger and what Ripple's doing and other such things. Okay, and that'll come when it comes. I don't have any control over it. The problem with the cryptocurrency world is actually a cryptographic problem. And it's actually a very easy to understand cryptographic problem, really hard problem to solve. So the problem here is if you're Bitcoin and there's Litecoin over there, if somebody sends you a Litecoin transaction, wants to put some Litecoin on your Bitcoin blockchain, you want to honor that. You have two questions you need to answer. First, are the Litecoins real? Do they exist? Do they come from somewhere? Second, have they been double spent or not? These are two foundational questions. The proof of existence and the non-existence of a double spend. Pretty simple, right? So how do we do that? Well, we trust the consensus of the system. We have a full copy of the blockchain. So wait a minute, if we have a thousand cryptocurrencies, how can we have a full copy of every chain? No, you can't. So wouldn't it be super cool if you construct a proof, a very tiny proof in the kilobytes, the megabytes, for each cryptocurrency that can act basically as a bridge between you and the other currencies so that when you get those transactions, you can verify that they exist and they haven't been double spent. We wrote a paper on this. It's called Non-Interactive Proofs of Proof of Work. And it's awesome. We love it. We just recently pushed it out, and we're translating it to proof of stake. And our hope is to pull this into as many proof-of-work cryptocurrencies as well. The carrot outside of interoperability is the fact that you also get super efficient, lightweight clients. Because the very same thing that allows you to validate that transactions are legitimate from external blockchains allows you to validate that transactions are legitimate within your own blockchain without possessing the whole copy. 
that's pretty cool science, and it's going to take some time and effort, but that's what we're doing there. Now, for the sustainability side, it comes down to voting, voting, voting. Now, we had an election recently, if you guys didn't, didn't know. Did your favorite candidate win? Mine didn't, although I, I work for Ron Paul, so I never would win at anything, guys, right? Okay. So the problem with that election was less about the candidates running. It was more about the voting system itself and the fact that we were given poor choices by the time we had the right to vote. So it's not just being able to vote that matters. It's what you get to vote on, when you get to vote, your incentives to vote, how you vote, who gets to be on the ballot, these types of things that are much, much more meaningful. And it's been studied by cryptographers and political scientists and other academics for a long time to come up with all these cool names like Condorcet voting systems and Borda voting systems and so forth. And the theory is quite interesting. So we have to take a position. And we think the best of the worst is liquid democracy. It actually has a lot of really cool, interesting properties. We get to do things like additive homomorphic encryption, God help us. But at the end of the day, what this is all about is being able to just delegate your vote to other people for uh, each situation, whether it be funding for a ballot or it be voting on a change to the underlying protocol. And it's just a matter of setting thresholds and assigning incentives closely. So like all good academics, we did a literature review. So we started with Dash, BitShares, and other systems that had been released in the past that had some notion of voting or treasury. And we extracted from them the good, the bad, and the ugly, similar to how we extracted from the Ethereum virtual machine the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we wrote a paper, put it on our website. Then we put a whole team of academics together at Lancaster University, wonderful place out in the UK, led by Bin Ching. And we're now actually writing papers on how to build a voting system and how to build a treasury that we can abstract away from a blockchain and then put in as a reference model for any blockchain that wants to adopt it, similar to our interoperability work. So our hope is that eventually this can do what Tezos is trying to accomplish, which is saying that you can mutate or change the chain, you can fund things, these types of things, but it can do it in a way where it has some good cryptographic guarantees and some fine game theoretic properties that your voting will result in good outcomes. As prior elections have shown, getting an election system right is super hard, and in itself it's worth a generation. But in my view, it's the only way that we can actually succeed or do anything interesting in the long term. Because at the end of the day, these systems need management. They're getting too big. The money is getting too big. The risk of their failure is getting too big. And if we can't find a way to govern ourselves, the governments are going to just govern us for us. And then we've lost. So that's what Cardano is in a nutshell. We have some ideas about scalability. And that starts with the Ouroboros agenda. The conceptual idea is just increase resources as you get people. We have some ideas about interoperability, and that's just all about saying, let's do some sidechain stuff and some magic there. And for the legacy stuff, let's join the right committees and just adopt the standards. And then we have some ideas about sustainability. And that sense from, let's build a good voting system, and let's go ahead and build a great treasury and a great way to change the, uh, the cryptocurrency. All of our work is open source. All of our research we try to make peer reviewed. And we try to collaborate with as many people as possible. I, which has three research centers, one at University of Edinburgh, one at Tokyo Tech, so that does mean I get to go to Japan a lot, and one at University of Athens. We're also setting some up here in the United States, and we'll be uh, announcing that soon, uh, hopefully. And we work with lots of different academics and researchers and open source developers. Uh, and it's been a heck of a lot of fun learning how to build this type of a project. Now, I mentioned there are some other competitors, and, you know, well, mention them. You have guys like IOTA and EOS, and they're in the scalability bucket. They're really trying to push that we can do millions of transactions per second, and these things can handle the load. There are people who are in the governance bucket for like the Dashes and the Tezoses of the world, who are really emphasizing that element of the system. And then you have people like Ripple and Aeon, who are living a lot in the interoperability side of the spectrum. So that's okay. That, that's their vision, and they're all executing, and they have money and people, and we love reading their papers, and we love seeing where they're going. For Cardano, we try to be a little bit like the capybara. We try to be like the Zen master of the animal kingdom. We try to be in the center, where we do a little bit of each and provide that to people. So thank you so much for coming. I hope this was a little educating, uh, and I'd love to get your questions. Okay, yeah, for questions, we're going to line up here in front of the mic. Hi, 
Ty Danko. Um, massive Cardano fan, and thank you for elevating the level of transparency in all of this. Um, what I don't get is um, when you make uh, Cardano, I'm going to call it backwards compatible, or being able to accept right. Solidity and Java and all these other languages, how and your essence is being more robust and more rigorous than the other languages. How do you keep um, the problems of, for like example, the um, parity wallet right. exploit from migrating into your system and polluting you? That is a great question. You know, actually, you're not the first person to ask me that question. Phil Wadler and I had a long conversation about it. He said, Charles, you know, if you're backwards compatible with Solidity, you basically accept all the sins of Solidity at the same time. Like, that's a good point, Phil. So the same way that, you know, poor countries protect people. They, they have walled, happy, rich people land that's segregated and everybody's safe, and then they have the hinterlands where it's Mad Max world. So you do the same thing in protocol design. So you have Cardano SL and you have Cardano CL. So SL is where we do our accounting, and then it's connected via sidechain to CL where we do the computation. And once you've done this abstraction, there's no reason you can't run multiple control layers, one of which is basically a clone of the Ethereum virtual machine, which is 100% backward compatible with the EVM bytecode, and the other one is Yella, our new virtual machine, which lacks complete backward compatibility. So as a coder, you have to make a decision of what you value. Do you value safety, security, or do you value ease of development and your old tools that you're used to? The network will provide resources to both, but the security guarantees are only with one, and it's encapsulated. So you have a varsity and a junior Yeah. I think so. Yes, sir. John Bottoms. I'm the inventor of the browser, uh, 1987. Congratulations. Uh, um, I'm sorry that JavaScript got put in it. I feel, I feel pretty bad about that. I, I, have, I have a few things to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, going forward, letters of credit, paperless letters of credit involve escrow, which fall into the Fed. Right. What do you see as the way forward? Paperless letters of credit involving escrow. So we could talk about lending in general. Do you want to go, go down that road? Is that? Well, mostly transactions where something, there's an agreement by a financial institution that's okay. controlled by the Fed. Okay. So anything that's Fed land is not going to run on a permissionless ledger. This is not going to happen. It's going to go permission ledger at, at some point. So you have solutions like Hyperledger, Enterprise Ethereum. There will be an Enterprise Cardano. We'll announce that at some point. And that's where you say, OK, this is a coordination issue between trusted known actors who don't trust each other fully. So Wells Fargo and Chase and others, they all know each other. They're public. They're regulated institutions. They won't show each other their customer ledgers without some arm twisting. But they do have a degree of trust that these are legitimate entities or that they have recourse if that entity lies. So the permission blockchain problem has always been a coordination problem of, I have a collection of actors that must do business with each other due to the dynamics of the market, whether that be telecommunications with Spectrum, or you know, you're moving from one telco network to another, and you want to have roaming, or that be medical records, where you move from one hospital to another hospital, or that be financial transactions, where you move from one bank ledger to another bank ledger. So what ends up usually happening is that they designate a protocol and a standard bearer to be the central authority we trust to help reconcile everything. So we say SWIFT or fixed protocol or whatever that may be. And then the lender of last resort is usually the central bank. So if they really screw it up, the central bank is there to come in and kind of resolve these types of things. So we have this nice hierarchy of necessity and hierarchy of centralization that's been constructed to coordinate institutions that don't want to work together but have to work together because of the nature of their customer. Where a blockchain is nice is a blockchain gives you the ability to say you can remove these centralized consortia of necessity. And now you can form a common state between your organizations where it allows you to agree on facts and circumstances. It allows you to agree on timestamps. It allows you to agree on a litany of little things that are just difficult and usually require God mode, some central actor to do that. Now, in the existence of this, 
you start having to beg the question, do we actually still need central banks? It's an interesting question. And that's probably going to be the next wave of monetary policy discussion that occurs, saying how much decentralization could be introduced into the central banks. The Federal Reserve itself is a decentralized entity. It's not just one single building sitting in Washington, D.C. with one guy at the top who's like really smart, or gal. It's a committee and a grouping of banks, and there's some degree of decentralization there. So they've already admitted that there needs to be federated control. So similarly, the same discussion that can happen in interinstitutional transactions can also happen with central banking itself. It's not going to happen in America to begin with. It likely will happen in small central banks. For example, in Barbados and Jamaica and all these other little places where they actually have their own central bank because they print their money. But they're forced to do trilateral settlements. So you can't go from the Bayesian dollar to the Jamaican dollar. You go from Bayesian dollar, US dollar, US dollar, Jamaican dollar. And they don't like doing that. It'd be nice to do bilateral swaps. So you can introduce coordination there. If it starts working, working, you can pull it into the stack a bit, and then gradually can open things up. Now, what are the other reasons you do this? Because you gain things like proof of solvency. You gain fraud proofs. You can do real-time continuous auditing. You know, it's much easier to reason about how customers and money is going to flow through that system. On the dark side, it gives you much easier ways of enforcing capital controls, which is why the Bank of China is incredibly interested in this type of a stuff. So it's an interesting question, and it's something that's right now not academic. It's actually happening. It's happening within R3 Sev. It's happening within the enterprise groups, hyperledger group. All these people are talking to financial institutions. Barclays has its own research desk. They're publishing papers on this stuff. Chris Clack is writing things like uh, smart contract templates and so forth. Digital Asset Holdings has a whole like line of research that they're doing for this type of stuff. They even create a programming language called DAML, and they have a whole like enterprise blockchain solution they're thinking about. So I suspect over the coming years, this will organically work its way in. Now, the question is, how does that system talk to my system, and Vitalik's system, and the IOTA system, and all the other blockchains that are probably here to stay? That requires some discussion. And that requires some standards, and that requires some careful thinking. Because these guys, if money is in this system, live within a regulated world, meaning they have metadata, they have attribution. So why did you do the transaction? Where did you do the transaction at? Where did you get the money from? Who the hell are you? you know, are you on a sanctions list? There is no de minimis clause for money laundering. right? So they have a whole bunch of regulated needs here, which none of these transactions natively have installed into them. And these guys aren't going to willingly put that stuff in. And I don't think they should. I think we have every right to resist that encroachment. OK? But if you're going to move your money from that system into J.P. Morgan Chase's ledger, you can't be like, yeah, I know you have to have a relationship with the regulator. But for me, can you just be principled? If you want to do business with that guy, you have to play by their rules. So there needs to be some discussion about what that looks like and what rights do you lose when you go from one enclave to the next enclave. And that's the next big conversation that's going to be happening uh, over the next few years. And I don't have an answer for you. I mean, we're going to write papers. We do participate in lobbying policy. Uh, I sit on several committees, one in Barbados, where we're doing a sandbox for ICOs. So it's like I do have a little bit of say and a little bit of knowledge. But these discussions are above my pay grade, and I'm just going to deal with them. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, my name is Shiv Patel. I'm a software engineer at AWS. OK. Um, just wondering, we use your services. Thank you. I'm <laughs> uh, just wondering, wh why is IOHK uh, committed to working on Ethereum Classic? What do you think is the market fit, given Cardano's existence? Yeah, that's a good question. You have kids? Uh, no. OK. When you have kids, you'll know this one. If you have two kids, which one do you love more? OK. So you know, Ethereum is a project I worked on, I love. The social contract, in my view of Ethereum, was code as law. I wanted a better Bitcoin. That's why I worked on it. Vitalik wanted a world computer. These are very different things. What I'm building with Cardano looks a lot more like a world computer than it does a, a commodity with principles and utility. So those visions were OK until they weren't. What happened was that an event occurred where one group of people were like, oh, obviously, we're over here. And another group of people were like, well, no, 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 hang on, guys. We're, we're here. What are you doing over there? Come on, come on over. 
and there's irreconcilable differences. So I happened to be in the minority, minority and I put my money where I, my mouth was. I hired a Scala team, and we built a, we built a client. You know, and we'll just keep working on it as a donation and keep, uh, keep it coming along. And, but you know, there's room in the world for digital commodities, by the way. We think Bitcoin is gonna go away just because Ethereum is here and IOTA's here and these other guys are here. It's gonna be here forever. And it's just gonna slowly lumber its way around as digital gold. So look at Ethereum as digital silver. It's a commodity in its own right, but it has more utility. You know, silver can be used in medical applications and semiconductors and things like that. So similarly, it has a smart contract language, and we'll try to innovate. We'll innovate on the proof of work side, we'll innovate and try to put a treasury into it and make it a self-sustaining system, and it's a great experiment in decentralized governance. I don't have control over ETC. There's a, several groups of people from Barry to the Commonwealth to FDEV, and these people are equally powerful, if not more so, than our say in the matter. Yet we have to coordinate to upgrade. That in itself is worth our participation because we're learning how to coordinate with a decentralized system. Instead of being like what Ethereum does or other people do, say they have a God mode and whatever that comes broadcast down, we just accept it. I'm not Steve Jobs. I don't come out with saying one more thing, here's the iPhone. We're all in this together, guys. We're building these things from the bottom up. And if we really are serious about these being decentralized systems, then we have to get serious about updating and upgrading systems in a federation where people actively don't like you or don't like your ideas on the other side of the federation without turning into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. So if anything, if ETC gives us that knowledge, okay, you know, that's great for me. And I'm also very proud of the software we wrote. We wrote the Mantis client. The Growth Antique team spent a whole year writing 10,000 lines Scala code. It's super concise, it's fast, it's beautiful. It's just insanely great, it's still not jobs. And you're just, gonna, you're just gonna love it. And it's, and by the way, we'll have it run in an Ethereum mode at some point. So it can both download the ETC blockchain and the ETH blockchain. So oh, guess what, we're Ethereum developers too. Maybe we can join the EEA. Maybe they'll send us an invitation. So, I understand it's controversial. Um, we, tr we have segregated teams. The Mantis team doesn't talk to or work with the Cardano team. They write in different programming languages and there's not a lot of common DNA there. Second, Cardano is a proof of stake system. Ethereum Classic will remain as a proof of work system, it looks like. And so we can innovate in different directions and run the experiment of which one seems to be better for the market. And we place Ethereum Classic as a commodity and we place Cardano as a third generation financial system that will be the stack for the three billion people who don't have one. Said that a lot. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, I'm Sid Ramesh. I uh, recently launched a weekly newsletter on Cardano. I, I saw Holy that. How Cardano. much ADA did you get? I said, did give this guy some ADA. I don't think we got any because the wallet was still in maintenance in Bitrex. Uh, oh, damn but it. We'll, we'll, we'll check it out. Um, okay. But I uh, encourage you all to check it out. We launched our first issue, and Charles actually retweeted it. Uh, uh, thanks to that. Uh, but uh, check us out. Subscribe. WeekendCardano.com. So my question is, for a lot of people here, at least in North America, uh, Cardano came as a surprise. Like, right. you know, a lot of people didn't hear about it. So uh, you guys were focusing a lot of your efforts in Japan sort of the Southeast Asian side. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the history of Cardano and why you guys decided to sort of do your initial, I guess, token sale in, in, in Japan? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it turns out that the world is bigger than America. I, I was shocked to learn this when I was traveling. <laughs> like, there's other countries and stuff. It's, it's really amazing. Um, no, but levity aside, you know, Asia's a great place. It's the future of finance. You have four billion customers. And guess what? They all have bad financial systems that are old. In Japan's case, it's like 30 years out of date. It's, a, it's still a cash economy. Like the first time I went to Japan, I went to buy a train ticket, and the guy didn't take a credit card, and it was $300 for a train ticket. And he's like, no, you got to pay cash. And I'm like, you're the teller for the train tickets. How do you not accept credit cards? This is insane. But this is Japan. This is where they live. So to me, it automatically made sense that if you wanted to have a meaningful, sustained impact on the evolution of finance and money, that it was very important to innovate in places where there was an actual need to change the system, number one. Number two, they're willing to listen to you. The problem with America and Western Europe is the regulators do not listen to us. The regulators just don't give a shit about innovators or how we go about our business. They just decide, how do we keep the people who are in charge in charge? That's why no one goes to jail when crises happen, and that's why we have the system we have. So I don't want to play in a rigged system. I would much rather go to the Caribbean, I'd much rather go to South America, to Africa, to South Asia. 
I'd much rather go to places where there is a need, there are customers, there is value, in some cases more so than the US markets, and go build something there. Second, at the time the project began in 2015, cryptocurrency penetration in Asia was actually very light. The largest country by far was China. Korea had almost not heard out of it at all, and Japan hadn't really done very much. They were like, oh, that Mt. Gox thing. Didn't the CEO of Bitcoin get arrested? <laughs> and it's only recently that we've seen a humongous speculative surge in the Asian markets. So we actually timed the markets correctly in that respect. So it was a strategic bet, it was a cultural bet, and it's something that did pay off. But you know, Asia is not the only place. We are going to enter Africa this year. We're planning to go into Ethiopia. We're planning to go into Ghana and to Kenya. <laughs> We're already in Barbados. In fact, as I speak, there's a Haskell class being taught at the University of West Indies. Uh, and Barbados is structurally very similar to Ghana and Kenya and Ethiopia if you look at the, any index like the amount of people who are unbanked, the average median income, education, these types of things. And it's a good sandbox for us to test our expansion plans into Africa. So we're going to enter those markets and we're already in Argentina. We've been there since 2016. And we have an office with uh, ATIX and it's right in the Bitcoin center there. We talk to Diego and Sergio and all the Rootstock guys pretty regularly. So it's great to be in a jurisdiction where when you talk about monetary collapse, they get it. <laughs> in fact, as a side story, one of my favorite guys I talk to a lot every time I go to Argentina, he took me to his house one time. He says, Charles, let me show you something really cool. He said, okay, so this is where I buried the silver. So when the money collapsed, the police, they came and they stole the silver. So let me show you something else. And he goes over behind this bush and he's like, this is where I buried the real silver. <laughs> And that's the decoy silver over there. <laughs> you learn these things. Uh, so I love being in countries like that. You know, the people are just so much more real, they're more genuine, they have nothing. And if you succeed, you build something. And frankly, that's in my view the only way we're ever going to get a good banking system, financial system in the Western world. You can't go and ask for permission. Please chase in Goldman Sachs, change the rig system that makes you rich. They're not going to do that. And no matter who you elect, they're not going to do that. But you build a system with three billion people that's worth more than the system we have. And the only way to do business with that system is to change your system. That I, think, that, I think, is going to change the world. And so that's why we focus on that area. It means that, unfortunately, you guys, you speculators, didn't make quite as much money. So sorry. But you know what? It's time for other people to play. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Joe Miano. I'm a data scientist at CVS Health. My question is around the scalability. So we think about the popularity of coins like right. IOTA, uh, Ryblox, things with non-blockchain technology. Um, I wanted to ask, how does Cardano achieve increased scalability, scalability and what are the theoretical, I guess, limitations and maximums in terms of transactions per second? Right, so we actually don't know what the peak TPS rate is. And even if you have a high TPS rate, the question is, can you propagate all the message through a gossip protocol? It's a really interesting question. So we're studying the network side using a science called Delta Q. And we have a firm out at Bristol led by a bunch of network theory academics. And basically, uh, they're called PNSOL. And we have some videos explaining how that works. And basically, their goal is to say, can we predict performance as the network topology changes and as we gain users proactively as opposed to retroactively through empirical analysis? That's one of the first steps, because you need to know where can you go with what you have. OK, now in terms of Ouroboros itself, the, why, the reason why we designed it the way we did is that we have this idea of an epic. So how Ouroboros works is that you have kind of two inputs that hold an election and they elect a bunch of slot leaders to run consensus for a few days, five days in the case of the current implementation. So you need a source of randomness, and then you need some sort of uh, election set of people who are eligible to become slot leaders. And that's called cryptographic sortition. Not a new idea, it's called Follow Satoshi by Ido Bentov. Uh, Sylvia McCauley also has a similar system and so forth. And the source of randomness you can get from a hash, from multi-party computation, all these things is very scalable. Okay. Now, the first thing to do is to say that if you've done this election in just the right way, that that epic is secure as long as the majority of the slots in the epic are honest, as long as that committee is majority honest, which is a similar assumption to Bitcoin, majority of miners being honest. The next thing to do is to say, can you take that epic and instead of having one of them run another one in parallel and another one and another one, another one, up to N, 
whatever the needs of the network happen to be for its historical throughput. It's kind of like a feedback mechanism like mining has with difficulty, right? We can go up and down based upon some evidence endogenous within the network. And that's the next generation of our protocol after we finish Ouroboros Prowse up and finish his peer review, is to explore how do we run epics in parallel. And then once we do that, then we get n performance. It's n times the amount of, uh, you know, the, the constant for whatever the TPS limit for that is. Now that's your raw theoretical throughput. And as you gain users, it's easier to gain committee members, so it seems to me like this will scale fairly well. The problem is still moving that data and storing that data. We're fairly along with the moving the data part, and using Rena, we think we have some good solutions. As for chopping up the blockchain and putting it into its own little buckets, and no one has to have a petabyte or exabyte of data, it's still a very hard problem. The good news is there's some very well-funded ventures that are trying to solve that, and we're reading their papers right now, and we're still kind of in the due diligence and literature review phase of the project. But that will become a necessity in 2018, 2019, 2020, as we become more successful and we gain more users. We imagine that these chains could become exabyte scale or yottabyte scale at some point if they become very useful. So there's just no way that anybody's ever going to be able to possess all of them. So you need to be able to chop up history. Now the good news is the same interoperability research we're doing that allows you to have a compressed representation of the chain but still verify things are correct, in addition to interoperability, can be repurposed for lightweight clients. So it is our belief that over an arc of time that research will bear fruit for the sharding effort of the data side as well. So that's kind of the, the best short answer I can give you. Now, if you want to know more, go to our uh, website. We have a library with tons of papers, and take a look at some of the papers, read through them, send some emails our way. And also, I can put you in contact with Neil and Peter, who work on the, uh, the more data science-y, network science-y side of our, uh, of our organization. We're actively testing about how do we simulate and test these networks as if they had a million users and a billion users and so forth. But this is a difficult systems problem, and it's uh, one that we're working our way through. Yes, sir. Uh, Matt, a uh, data scientist, I had a question more about the practical side. You mentioned not only proof of stake, but also uh, being able to have a bit more control over the nature of the language that smart contracts are written in. As someone who's programmed in Solidity, thank you so much for that. Um, a bit more on the practical side, do you think this could sort of lo potentially lower the barrier for creating uh, mobile uh, decentralized apps? Well, that's a really good question. So how do we run these things on cell phones, and what does that experience look like? Problem there is that that's not a fair game either. Apple and Google have a little bit of a say in what goes on their phones, right? So we can't, maybe they like crypto capybara, but maybe they won't like crypto Silk Road. Uh, <laughs> you know, so you have to think carefully about that. Okay, so first for language design itself, because this is an area that I'm a little passionate about. I, I love it a lot. Um, the first question you have to ask is, what problem are you trying to solve with any programming language? No one language is a universal language for everybody. You're just dealing with a troll when they say, well, my language can do everything. You're just, you're just dealing with that. So for financial contracts, there's actually a very meaningful thread of discussion that's occurring about whether those actually need to have gas and be Turing complete or can we build a domain-specific language that has a collection of combinations and that is complete and sufficient for all financial relationships? And there's some great research that's been done along this line. For example, there's a project called Project Actus. And Actus has this idea of 30 primitive contracts that are composable that can allow you to re basically rebuild any bank or rebuild any insurance company and so forth. So you can build a domain-specific language wrapped around that. There's even better research done at Microsoft Research by Simon Peyton Jones. It was called Adventures in Financial Engineering. And this was back in 2000. And what Simon did, he was one of the creators of Haskell, a brilliant guy, very charismatic. But what Simon did is he said, let me reimagine the bank as a functional language and let's just see how far we can go with the minimal amount of functionality possible. Chris Clack has done the same with smart contract templates, as I mentioned at Barclays. And then also Blockstream is doing this research as well with a language called Simplicity, where they're actually thinking carefully about how do we get something that's better than Bitcoin script for the developer, but doesn't allow you to shoot yourself in the foot, chop your leg off. Okay, we actually have a project at uh, Kent University under Simon uh, Thompson and his postdoc Pablo, we're creating a language called Marlow, where we're taking a wrap up of many of these things we've learned and trying to create that Turing incomplete DSL for developers. Now, what does that mean? It means briefly that it's more like a paint by numbers style contract. So, you know, you're kind of like Bob Ross, you know, like put a tree here, put a cloud here. So, similarly, like 
I want to do this many multi-sig, and I, I want to do escrow here, and have an oracle here, and whatever, and you just kind of plug those things in, and then you just know the contract is going to work as you've written it. You as a developer don't have to think about that. Once that becomes a standard, it's a lot easier to have a meaningful discussion about how do we get these things to run in different environments, whether that be on virtual machines like the EVM or Yella, or that be on cell phones and these types of things. Okay, so that's a discussion, it's a conversation. We have limited control over what can go on to Android and what can go into iOS. You do what you can, right? Now, the other side of it is, do you have ideal languages that are really good for robust applications for programming smart contracts? We have one called Plutus. We're developing with Phil Wadler and Daryl McAdams, and it's basically like Revenge of Haskell. It's, it's the next generation, man. We're, we're really pushing that hard, and we think we built a really nice language. So that's the best non-answer that I can give you to your, to your particular question, and I have to kind of punt it a little bit, because the, the reality is that it's not in my control to create a good development experience for mobile clients. I can build my own client, and I can make it good. I can write in F-sharp and use Xamarin and have like a beautiful cell phone app, great. And I can go beg to get it on an app store and deploy it through, but at the end of the day, that is a walled garden. And that's the problem with walled gardens, is that you don't get certainty with projects. You have to have negotiations. Banking is a walled garden, I have to negotiate with them. And cell phones are a walled garden, they have to be negotiated with as well. Now, if they're too draconian, we'll do what we did with money. We'll build our own hardware. And that might come, and we might have to. So, yes ma'am. We're running out of time. We're gonna running out of time, so let's do like uh, one more question. And then, uh, and then we're going to have to call it a night. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm honored to have the final question. And I want to thank you again. Well, what's your name? My name is Youssef. Nice to meet you. Uh, I want to thank you for your contribution to the future. Uh, incredible. As we all know, blockchains are technology, but also economic systems right. and social consensus mm -hmm. networks. You intimately have experience in a contentious hard fork, and after years of civil war about the scaling debate, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash diverged. And although on face that was a technological issue, in reality it was a power struggle mm -hmm. to be future oligarchs. What lessons have you learned in the nine years that this has been going on about what Blockchain 3.0 means in terms of economy as well as social consensus and ideology? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you saved the best for last. Thank you so much. Okay. You ever watch The Simpsons? Okay, so building these protocols is almost like this one scene from The Simpsons. So Mr. Burns gets angry at Springfield and he's like, I'm going to turn the power off for the city. So he and Smithers, they go through this elaborate series of doors and hidden passageways and retina scanners and so forth to get to the heart of the power plant so he can turn off the power. So just as he arrives in the heart of the power plant, there's this rickety old wooden door that leads to the outside, and there's like a dog inside the room, and he kicks the dog and shuts the door. And that's unfortunately where we're at right now in the design of cryptocurrencies. The sticker price is very expensive. You have to learn all of these extremely bizarre, complicated terms and concepts, like public keys and private keys, and you have to go ahead and download this strange client that's peer-to-peer -peer and run it on your computer, and then you have to be really careful with the way you use it and back it up, and oh, and by the way, a hacker is always trying to steal it from you, and if you, you know, something happens, that's on you. So you pay a huge consumer unfriendly price to use the system. You're going through all those elaborate tunnels. And at the end of the rainbow, you have that back door of, oh, by the way, there's like six people who basically run this thing. And they run it in the shadows like a colstered emperor because they write the code and you trust them to make the code correct because they run the mining pools or they own a large chunk of the currency or they run the exchanges and they decide who gets listed and who doesn't get listed, right? Or they run the media. So this is the human reality in all systems. Where there is power in money, there will be attempts to centralize and to control that power in money. No one is resistant to this, ever, in any capacity. That's the lesson of Satoshi. That's why Satoshi had to die and disappear. You can't build a cult of personality around someone because no matter how good that person is, how smart that person is, they will let you down, they will betray you. 
or they will get killed or corrupted or coerced or forced to act the way that breaks your heart. There is no greater example in my mind than Ripple. I like Ripple. I like David. I like the guys there. I think they're good guys, and they do good engineering. And for a long time, I had a lot of respect. They get kicked all the time, and people piss on them. And, you know, and for a long time, I always defended them. I said, ah, you know, Arthur, at the end of the day, and Chris, these guys are good guys. They're okay. And then they hire Ben Losky and put him on their damn board of directors. I felt sick for the entire day. I really did. I felt sick to my stomach. Because it wasn't like, oh, we brought him as an advisor, we hired him to do some legal work. It's like we put him on the board of directors to decide the philosophy of our company and who we are as people. Because it's necessary for the next step in their evolution so they can do their IPO and all become billionaires and ride off into the sunset with Mark Zuckerberg. Great. But that's the nature of humanity and who we are. So the first lesson I've learned is no one is above corruption. So assume everyone will become corrupted at some point. So, how do we establish that things will work right? Process over people. If I make a science claim, don't trust me. Trust the peer review process. It's been around for a long time. It's given us the planes, trains, and automobiles we have and the physics we have. It's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good, especially in the computer science world, okay? That's the first point, process over people. Second, when people write code, Ask who watches them, who's reading the code, who's checking the code. We have an external auditor, it's called FP Complete. We'll start publishing those reports in February most likely. Who they say, oh, here's the good, the bad, and the ugly of what Charles has done. It's not all swimmingly perfect. But you know, you accept these things. So make sure that there are checks and balances that are in place behind how the code is written and the claims that are made. That only gets you so far. Your system needs to also have a way of governing itself within the system. You need a constitution, you need rights. The reason why I still have the freedom of speech and the reason why I still have the freedom of religion is because some very smart people a long time ago wrote that down. And they put it in a document that's really hard to change. And boy, there's a lot of people who love to change it if they could change it. So protocols are all about how do we enshrine those principles that we started with before everybody got rich, before everybody got powerful, into the protocol so that when they get rich and powerful, they get tempted to change things for their personal benefits, they can't. This is why I was so against the Dow fork with Ethereum. Because I felt like, okay, well now for the rest of time, every single time a bad event happens, you have to make a decision. And somebody is expected to make a decision, one way or the other. Parity has like, what, 200 million locked. Somebody has to make that decision. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But admitting that a decision is there to be made by a person is admitting you've actually given a CEO to your system. And that just felt wrong to me. The Bitcoin core developers resisted that. When B uh, Mt. Gox happened, they personally, some of them had millions of dollars in Mt. Gox, and they chose not to reimburse themselves. So I think those are some of the basic lessons. Scientific claims need to be peer reviewed, not by random normal weirdos over the internet, but by scientists, if you're making scientific claims, because they spend decades of their lives at great institutions like CU Boulder and Boston University, to learn how to do this stuff. And code claims should be reviewed by credible third parties and bake a constitution into your protocol itself and give a voting system to people who have it. All right, well this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Charles Hoskinson. <laughs> Thank you, Charles, for coming all the way to Cambridge to see us. We appreciate it so very much. <laughs> Thank you, all of you, for coming tonight. Please make sure to tweet Cambridge Blockchain Cambridge. Let people know.